Hello, welcome to Tuesday Morning Left Guard. Shockingly, we debut on an actual Tuesday morning. Matthew Collar, former Minnesota Viking, Jeremiah Searles. We are back to preview Vikings and Packers, and this will be going on all season long with the caveat that you go on a hunting trip and then you come back after week two, but we'll get to that later. Jeremiah, what is going on, man? Great to have you back. Oh, uh, that hello. Welcome. Just gave me a little tingles at my spine. It's it's been too long, my friend. It's, it's good to be back. It's, I got to see you when I was up there for the scrimmages between the Niners and we talked about it and I'm very excited to be back. And yes, we're here on a Tuesday, which is a major plus. I got a little something for you. Okay, here you go. What's that sound you hear coming from the trenches? It's former Minnesota Viking offensive lineman Jeremiah Searles. It's time for the Tuesday morning left guard show on Purple Insider. They're too strong, my dog. We're too strong. Oh, that is fantastic. That is 16-year-old Jeremiah post-ACL surgery right there. Just fat and happy. Yeah, people can't see it if they're listening on the podcast, but I found I just Googled a picture of you to sit like when you make the intro to play it like on a button bar situation. This doesn't really matter, but like I, you have to add a picture. So mm. I could have just put a football, but I Googled the most embarrassing looking picture <laughs> of you to use for this purpose. And that's that's a gem <laughs> given the two thumbs up. The yeah, I'm going to play the NFL. <laughs> Double who thumbs, would, baby. Who would have told Jeremiah Searles at that point you would have been an NFL player? No chance. I would have told you you're high. <laughs> well, anyway, since you were, <laughs> that means hardcore football breakdowns. Mm. And I'm I'm going to start out with our first Tuesday morning left guard with the hardest core of hardcore. Mm. An edge rusher. A left tackle. Okay. Zadarius Smith versus a returning David Bakhtiari. To me is the matchup that could determine this game. And I have, just to hit all the bases here, a what does that stat mean mm. for you? Because Aaron Rodgers' yards per pass attempt, clean versus pressured, drops from 8.5 and a 123 quarterback rating to 5.1 yards per attempt when pressured. It seems Zadarius V. Bakhtiari is pretty darn important in this matchup. Absolutely. And you talk about two guys that know each other well, right? Like two guys that have, they played against each other. They know each other well. And that goes, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like Bakhtiari knows what to do to stop Smith, but also Smith knows some weaknesses in Bakhtiari's game. So that's going to be really curious how they do that. Do they slide to him? Do they double team him? Do they chip him? Because I mean, Bakhtiari's played what one game in the last two years. So, I mean, he's not going to be a polished product by any means. He's got plenty of kinks to work out in his game. Now he might be fresh, but at the same time, like you just cannot replicate game speed after two years. I think we saw a little bit of it with Daniil Hunter, right? Like it takes some time to get back into the rhythm of what game speed really looks like. So that's going to be a really fun matchup. But speaking of edge rusher, I'm really excited to watch Daniil Hunter too. You know, that's a guy that he shook my hand at that scrimmage, like chest bumped me. And I was like, don't, don't touch me anymore. Like you're too big and strong for me. I don't want those problems. But those two guys are going to absolutely, if you want to beat Aaron Rodgers, you have to get to his feet and affect his passing game. And that's going to be really fun to watch those two guys just pin their ears back and go. My favorite part about the Daniil handshake, it's like the Adrian Peterson handshake for back in the day, but he's so soft-spoken. He'll just be like, hey, man, how are you? It's nice to see you. And you're like, please don't kill me. Yes, 100%. <laughs> I was like, I don't I don't need that long arm in my chest ever again. I had that <laughs> one, two, no, no more. No, thank you. Okay, here's another what does that stat mean? I came prepared. Uh, Zadarius Smith, the last time he played – at U.S. Bank Stadium was 2020. It was weird. There was no fans. But I looked at where he lined up in those games, and I'm going to read it to you. He played six plays at defensive tackle, nine at left outside linebacker, 13 at right outside linebacker, and nine at middle linebacker. What does that stat mean about what they can do with this gentleman? It'll be very different from what we are used to seeing, which is Hunter on one side and Everson Griffin on the other. Zedarius Smith could be anywhere at any time. Yeah, you know, and that's great because with this new defense that we're going with, the, the more 3-4 style, like you can create some wild pressures out of a 3-4 defense, like with just where, with where guys line up, where you bring guys from. And so when you add Zedarius Smith into this mix, you always, I think Daniil Hunter's the guy you're like, listen, I want your hand on the ground and I want you just going. 
right? Like just put your hand and just do your thing. But what Zadarius Smith did, and I can remember when we used to play him, he used to have what was called a spinner package, right? And when I say spinner package, that's when a defensive lineman walks and like kind of stands around like a linebacker. And so as an offensive line and from a protection scheme, you have to always account for him like he's a D lineman. That might mean there's three guys on one side. Like you're still going to slide over there and leave someone else because the worst thing you can do is be like, oh, count him as a linebacker. And then you have a running back trying to walk up and meet him at the B gap as the red C parts between the guard and the tackle, right? That's just a recipe for disaster. Now, it's not saying we won't do that because you know, then maybe the Packers will do it too. We can hope. But I think the biggest thing is just going to be they're going to line him up and maybe start him on the right side and loop him all the way back on the left. So you have to engage three way bumps between the guard, the center, and the guard or whoever it might be. But he just adds a unique pressure flavor into what you can do with him. And I think you'll see a lot of him lining up all over the place because that creates problems. And also it makes Aaron Rodgers have to think, okay, where am I pointing the protection? Where am I going to point everything? Instead of thinking about coverages, he may spend a little bit more time at the line thinking about protections, which like you said, it just adds another layer to him not getting the ball out quicker. And I think that there's a, a speaking of like different layers that go on to this uh, last year at us bank stadium, it was morgue like at times. I mean, even Aaron Rodgers after the game, I know I brought this up before, but like Aaron Rodgers after the game, it was shocking because he said, yeah, it just wasn't that loud today. And, and like, you know, uh, Aaron is uh very open with his thoughts about everything, but I mean, I like, that guy would know like he's played some of those games where even you see Rogers looking like I can't get, you know, signals out to people. They can't hear what I'm saying. And he's looked shook before at times at us bank stadium. I think the noise will be back because the guy on the sideline is not there or Satan as a uh, former, <laughs> former, um, I'm going to say former coach on the staff, though. I have a pretty good idea of which, former coach on the staff may have told Tyler Dunn that Mike that that don't, don't whisper it. Don't whisper. We all know who might have referred to Mike Zimmer as that, but with Mike Zimmer, not on the sideline anymore, it is refreshed. It is new era. It is week one. Uh, Explain to me the noise and how that impacts an offense. Cause I think it it can get to anybody. Yeah. I mean, this has got, this has got circa 2016 game opener of, U.S. Bank, Packers, Vikings written all over it again, right? And that was honestly one of the loudest, besides the Minneapolis Miracle, that I ever heard that stadium. And so this has got that primed and ready to go. And then you add on top of it, if you don't think that, I'm, I haven't read, but I'm sure that all the newspaper and everyone has that quote from last year of Aaron Rodgers saying, no, it just wasn't that loud. And it's one of those things that, like, you poke the bear a little bit. Like, you know, hey, fans, have maybe one or two more of those beers before the game and bring a little bit more energy, right? Like, there is all of those factors playing to it. And so, to answer your question, when it's loud, like, especially in a week one scenario, like, when you're not ready to go, and the Packers starters did not play a ton in the preseason, right? Like, they did not play a lot. So, they're not in full season, midseason form where there's that nonverbal communication of maybe it's all hand signals and maybe it's all just like kind of you know from throughout the weeks of practice what you want when this certain look comes. There's going to be verbal communication that comes through, whether it's the snap count, whether it's mid-game checks, whether it's sideline checks, right? Like, so noise plays a huge factor in just slowing down the communication. They'll still find a way to get the communication, but when you slow down the communication and now all of a sudden they're trying to get things yelled at each other and there's three seconds left on the shot clock instead of 12 seconds left on the shot clock, that just allows for so much more creativity on the defensive side because now they're just hut, 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 and they're just trying to get it snapped instead of getting it second. Okay, here's the play call. Here's the check. Let's reassess the defense and then snap the ball. It just adds a chaotic feel to it. And when you throw chaos into it, that usually tends to favor the defensive side of the ball more than the offensive side of the ball. So my understanding of how this used to work with Zimmer is that like Anthony Barr could make choices based on what he saw from the offense and the offense trying to get the signals out and taking that extra time could not adjust. And I think that's why a lot of times we saw, oh man, a tight end is on Daniel Hunter and oh no, the tight end is now dead. And so is the quarterback like uh, that. I I mean, this is another story though, is like Mike Zimmer it, his first game, you know, U.S. Bank Stadium, he has a great defensive performance against Aaron Rodgers. He really seemed to know how to take advantage of U.S. Bank Stadium. I don't know this for sure, but I but I would bet that they asked him, 
Like, how can we set this up the best for you noise wise when we build this stadium for you to take advantage of it? And he knew how to do it. Uh, this is Ed Donatel's first time doing this. I, I guess I wonder, not, not that he won't know what noise is, but like Zimmer really mastered that, I think, when it came to messing with quarterbacks and understanding the checks and changes that they were going to make based on his looks and how to readjust quickly uh, when, when he you know, got those looks. Yeah, you know, and that's a twofold piece, too. You know, Zimmer knew how to use the noise, but Zimmer, as much as we ushered him out the door quickly, like he was a brilliant defensive mind. You know, he knew defense, especially early when he was here in the early parts of his Viking era. Like he knew how to use the defense to his advantage. And I will say he knew how to kind of game plan Aaron Rodgers really well. But that also became this trust factor that he had developed over years with guys like Kendricks and Anthony Barr of trusting them to get into the right checks, right? When you talk about doing checks on defense, it's just as important as the the offensive side in when it is loud. The difference is the defense doesn't have to make sure that the O-line is all. They just kind of turn around and give like a little fist bump signal and everyone knows exactly what that means. Now, it's defense is so simple compared to offense. Like they're just dumb on that side of the ball. <laughs> but like you're exactly right. Zimmer knew how to use that to his advantage. I think that this defensive coordinator, it might take him a little longer because it is a new scheme and it is new pieces and it is new players. And so they do have to have that communication on the side. So I think that you might see maybe less checks out of this defense because you don't want to necessarily get into a chess match with Aaron Rodgers unless you're absolutely prepared, right? Like that's one of those, like if you sit down at the table and you want to play the mind game with Aaron Rodgers, like you better be ready because he can make you look stupid and like in a hurry. And so I hope that like the, a lot of this is going to be, Hey, let's play our game. Let's do our thing. And let's disguise stuff and make him almost overthink things and try and over communicate at the line instead of letting us try and overthink it and kind of outsmart ourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that this matchup between Rodgers and a completely different defensive scheme is sort of at the top of the list. When, when it comes to this Fangio type of scheme, which, you know, there's a funny thing, and we're going to find out if this works out or not, but it's like, we've got a guy who knows McVeigh, we've got a guy who knows Fangio, everybody, this should work. Um, but but there is, I, I feel like there is something really effective uh, about playing the two deep safeties and then having Harrison Smith do a lot of different stuff. And sometimes we act like, oh man, it's a whole new scheme. And I'm like, I don't know. I think Zimmer did a lot of playing Harrison deep and then messing with people, right? But like, th I, that is, a, is an interesting concept because the Packers also want to run the football, mm. right? And that's like their whole thing now is, Let's run the football and then we're going to have Rodgers run play actions and bootlegs. And when he does it, that that's this offense is built for Jared Goff or Kirk Cousins. When he does it, he wins MVP two years in a row. Or or John Elway back in the day wins the Super Bowl run in Gary's boots. So uh yeah, I guess I wonder what you think of, of that like concept in this matchup because you have a team that wants to run the ball, but the Vikings are going to ask their safeties to do a lot in that run game uh, because they're going to play the two safeties back. Yeah, you know, it's going to be really curious to see how far back they play. You know, I think that initially every defense is going to roll up there and be like, hey, we're going to play our safeties at our normal depth, whether that's 12 or 16 or whatever it might be, and say, hey, front, stop the run, right? Like, stop the run, play gap assignment football. Dalvin Tomlinson, all you boys up front, hey, stay in your gap. And then if the safeties have to make an eraser, like they have some space to do it. Right. And that's how you really want to stop the run when you have to start being like, OK, we're not stopping the run. They're getting four. They're getting five. But like that's when you have to say, hey, Harrison, you might have to play at eight. Right. Like we might need you to play at eight yards instead of 12. And that opens up some stuff in the back end on the pass game that you don't love. But at the same time, if you can't stop the run in this league, then it really doesn't matter. Like teams are just going to beat you. So it's going to be curious at how they do that. I will say that the three four system is really built to stop the run. Like there's more bodies in the box. There's more angles. There's more gaps covered. So it is built to stop the run. What it isn't built for is for a team to just start blowing the top off your defense, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what a three, four is susceptible to. Now you try and counter that with, well, we have more people rushing the passer, right? So they can't sit back there and, and throw deep all the time. But when you do, and you allow some of those guys, like there's just not as much security on the back end when you do do stuff that's more, innovative with your safeties football football, football. <laughs> we are back i mean just like riding a bicycle we haven't done this since your fake uh jim harbaugh presser but now we are back um 
boy, thank goodness that didn't oh my happen. Gosh, right? That would have been a disaster. That's one of those where you're like, you know, there's some there's some opinions where you have them and you're like, I don't know, it could go either way though. You know, like I'm not confident on this, uh, but it's kind of what I think. With Jim Harbaugh, I was like, no, <laughs> do not do that. That's going to be a problem. You don't want any of that. And no. then like instantly that came to fruition anyway. Uh, so let's talk about the other side of the matchup mm. and in the Vikings offense, you were there at camp to see a little bit of this thing operate against the San Francisco 49ers in the joint practices. Uh, what was your take on kind of just how it looked in training camp with what they're trying to do? Yeah. You know, I think that this offense is exciting. You know, it's, it's fun. I think that, I think Vikings fans are going to be really excited. I think they saw it during camp at the open practices. Like there's a lot more ooh and awe factor to this offense than there was a year ago, right? It's more motions and shifts, which you and I begged for last year over and over and over again. Like, right, like please stop lining up in too tight and thinking that the whole world doesn't know you're running play action boot. Like, please. Right. And so there's more of that to it. You know, the, the thing that I'll be really curious about is the workload that they will give Dalvin. You know, like I think everyone is used to seeing him touch the ball so much because of what the offense was that he may not touch the ball as much as he has in years past. And that could be good. It could be bad. But I think that we're going to see a lot more of that quick passing game with what's going to be. I was really pleased with what I saw out of the offensive line when I was at those things. You know, I think Brian O'Neill is still playing at an extremely high level. Derisaw looks like he's taken a huge jump just mm -hmm. from what I saw from last year to this year. And so you talk about you can win in this game. You can win in the NFL with two championship tackles. That's what it takes to win in the NFL. And I think that we are on the road to it. I'm not ready to anoint. I'm, I'm still blue on Darisaw. If we're going to go back to our color yes. gauge of how we rate young players, yes. I'm still blue on Darisaw, but I think he's trending in the right direction. Um, and then you talk about our guys on the inside. We still have Garrett Bradbury to look at, so that can get interesting. But you talk about some young players. Ingram's going to get the start, which I'm excited. I think he had a good camp. So a lot of guys up front to be excited about um, the two tackles specifically um, and really just see kind of what this rhythm of this offense looks like. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the different things that they want to do pre-snap and everything else, does that help the offensive line? And I ask because the offensive line, regardless of all the things you just said, which was funny because you went like, and Garrett Bradbury, and then there's other guys, uh, but, <laughs> but, but but I, I tend to think, though, that anything that flashes in front of the, def the defense's eyes and makes them hesitate even the littlest bit has to help the offensive line. But I also might not know what I'm talking about here. So is that a thing? <laughs> it is, you know, and, and the reason it, it's more on the mental side than the physical side. I will say that, you know, as an offensive lineman when you can be engaged and this does take a little bit more time in the classroom for these guys. And I'm sure Chris Cooper's been working on it. When you have shifts in motion pre-snap, you have to be really aware of what's going on as the whole versus just focused on who's lined up in front of me, right? If you're going to motion from three by one and you're going to motion to a two by two set, you have to see, does someone run with him? Does coverage rotate? Like all those things are what we call pre-snap indicators. And that can really help you as an offensive lineman say, okay, if, them, if a guy runs with them, okay, that's man coverage. This could be a pressure look. Hey, they just rock and rolled the safeties and bumped one over. <clears throat> maybe they're just running zone coverage here if it's a pass play. So now maybe we're only worried about four down rushers instead of five, right? Like there's certain things that look like that. And then the run game specifically, it really helps with shifts and motions because you start to see where guys gap integrity lies, right? If you're running a, if you're running a split zone, or you're running an inside zone and guys are running all over the place, gap integrity can really start to fall apart if you all just stay on your track and say your thing. So those are all really good pre-snap indicators that I loved as I got older as an offensive lineman because they allowed the game to slow down for me. But it does take a lot of time of studying and understanding and you have to be really keyed into the formation calls. You have to be keyed into the motion checks. You have to be keyed into all those things so it can add another layer of mental <clears throat> stuff that you're looking at, but it can really help you overall in the game. Gap integrity. Uh, you are, as the kids integrity. say, in your bag today. I uh, love it. You know, why don't you do this? And then I have a more broad question that's mm. less insane football. But um, can you just, can you explain what you mean by gap integrity? Absolutely. So as a defense, you have to have what's called gap integrity. And what that means is every gap from the center all the way out is labeled a gap between the center and the guard B gap between the guard and the tackle D gap between the tackle and tight end. And then just outside 
right? So those are your gaps and they mirror each other on the opposite side. So as a defense, when you're lined up, you say, okay, I got my four down linemen. We're just going to call it four down. Four down linemen, my three linebackers. I have to make sure that every gap is accounted for as a player, right? So the nose tackle is probably responsible for the A gap. Well, then the defensive end would be responsible for the D gap. And then the linebacker would have the B gap. And then a safety or someone else is responsible for that C gap. Now you'll have teams that are like the Steelers, for example, they play two gap system. So big Cam Hayward likes to sit there and plant plant his feet in the ground and he's going to get extension. He plays both the A and the B gap, right? So it's all just dependent on what scheme you like to run. But when you're bringing motion and stuff, gaps get switched. Right. So if you're bringing you're coming from a three by one and you motion one receiver over and now you're going to a two by two set. Well, you just created another gap or you eliminated a gap on one side. And so now you have to as a defense shift and say, okay, who's responsible where? Because you might have going from over where you have the defensive tackle over the guard and the three technique. And now all of a sudden they go two by two and we shift to under. Now that three technique bumps down to a nose guard. And now there's an uncovered gap. So those things really just allow the defense to have to make those checks and moves when you have those things going. And it, all it takes is one guy to miss his gap. And that's where those explosive runs come from, right? One guy getting pushed out of his gap or getting clogged and not hitting his gap. That's where the running backs can really hit those lanes. Or even in the pass rushing game, you have lanes and the gaps of when you're pass rushing, you get two guys pissing in the same Coke bottle and they're moving and they're not in the same, they're not in the same gap. Now Kirk Cousins can step up. He can roll out. He can do all kinds of things because you lost gap integrity. Where does that one come from? Tony Sperano. Oh, that is a Tony. Just... That is a Tonyism <laughs> to a T of two, two guys pissing in the same Coke bottle. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we really have checked all the boxes here today, but, um, if, if you're not familiar with how the gaps work, like the a gap would be between the center and the guard B between the guard and the tackle and so forth down the line, um, for as many tight ends. Now, if you throw a sniffer in there, I don't know what to do at that point. I don't know how that works. Uh, my wife is calling college football this year. Mm. And so we've been going over like some of the football -y things that she could bring up on the, on the broadcast. And I'm like, well, at some point you have to mention when there's a sniffer out there, which mm. is when a tight end lines up like behind the guard. And I think it's called the sniffer for the reason that you think, right. That he's like he's, right behind the guard. He's right there. All up in that thing. Right. <laughs> all up in there. Okay. Let me ask a broad question since you just blew everybody's mind with what motion does. And I think something to watch, just something that you can like actionably just notice as you're watching the game is that this offense will run a motion right before the snap and then run to the same side, almost as if they're running behind the receiver, which seems counterintuitive, but the Rams do it a lot. And I think the Vikings are going to do it and it just messes with the defense. Uh, especially this is why like receivers blocking in this offense is super important. Um, but I wanted to ask you a more broad question, mm. which is you think it'll work for Kirk? I want to say yes. I want to say yes. And, and the reason I want to say yes is because I think the more pre-snap indicators that you can give for Kirk, the better. The more that he is such a smart guy, right? Of all the things that we'll talk about, Kirk, of this, that, and the other thing, he is a very intelligent human being. And the more that you can give him in his pre-snap toolbox of identifying, knowing what the defense is, like we said, is it man, is it zone, who's running with him, all those things allows Kirk to then play his own little game in his mind of where do I go with the football? Okay, if there covers this, then I go here with the ball. If they go here, it doesn't allow him to improvise as much, which I think is probably one of Kirk's lesser part of his games, um, his, imp his improvisation when things break down. But I think his strength of his game is knowing what's in front of him and knowing how to attack that. So I do think this works with Kirk in that. The problem is when it does break down, sometimes we have everyone over on, on one side and you got a, cop, a bunch of motions and you don't get what you're expecting. That's when I could see it possibly going off the rails for him. But I think overall it's going to be a big benefit for him. So the uh, one of the most memorable moments from press conferences of training camp, um, less memorable than in previous years with Mike Zimmer doing things at the podium, but uh, Wes Phillips um, was asked about Kirk, uh, you know, improvising. And he said, we'd rather not <laughs> like, and then just, you know, like, well, we want Kirk to do offense and outside of the structure too much, which I think is the case. But one thing I'm very fascinated to find out is just how much they can put on his plate, because I think that Mike 
felt they needed to simplify after 2018 was a disaster. And I think that he was right in a lot of ways. So now you're kind of doing this dance of like, there's some wide open stuff that you're asking Kirk to read a lot of things, but there's also like some of the, we're going to make it easy and run the boots that's still mixed in here. And I, I think that it's a very delicate balance for Kevin O'Connell. I, I would agree with you. You know, I think that when you think about it though, like look at this Rams offense when it had Jared Goff and look when it had Matt Stafford, right? Like you're, you're talking about completely different things. Now, I think that Kirk is obviously better than Jared Goff. I think a lot of people are obviously better. I don't necessarily know if he's Matt Stafford level, but I think that even if you're just somewhere in the middle of that, like it's going to be better because this offense, I think though it may look complicated, I think is very simple. You know, I think it is very simple because of how much you do pre-snap doesn't change. You can run the same play from five different formations and get to it from pre-snap motion and it's the same thing. So it may look more complicated, but it's not. And so I think for Kirk, that's a good thing. And so I think that when you start talking about, hey, how do we help Kirk, right? How do we make sure that we are helping Kirk Cousins be the best he can be? It is a simple offense, but you can load more on a guy's plate when the base offense is simple, right? When the base offense is complicated in itself, and then you throw more on top of that, that's where it can become too much. But when you look at this offense and say, okay, it's very simple in its base form, the sprinkle ins, the crazy like gadget stuff or some other trick stuff, that's just going to get added to it. That's not too much on Kirk's plate, in my opinion. So here's, I mean, I have several questions about like this offense. Um, in one being, is it going to be more of the Jared Goff style or more of the Matt Stafford style? Because I think those are two different things. And if we're doing like a sliding scale of quarterbacks, I think Kirk is closer to the type of quarterback than Jared Goff is. Uh, maybe like a better version. Although I don't know. I mean, Jared went to the Super Bowl. It's like hard to sit there and say, well, Kirk, Kirk is just like so much better than him. But one of the keys is that uh, Jared Goff always had great offensive line play. Hmm. And Matt Stafford had that as well. So let's get a little more into the swing guys that are going to determine what happens here? Ed Ingram at right guard is kind of the biggest one to look at because it's a rookie. It's going against Kenny Clark right away, who will eat your face. I mean, th this is as tough of a matchup that you could start off with as far as an interior player in probably the entire NFL. I and mean, this guy, as far as at his position, is top three, top four. I, I think that's a very dangerous game for the Vikings to be playing, and they have to really consider that that Kenny Clark uh, could completely wreak havoc on this. But you had a chance to watch, you know, some of training camp and, and even talk to some linemen out there at Vikings uh, camp. So, what what is your feeling on the rookie stepping in at right guard? You know, from what I watched from him, it was very obvious that he was the best right guard on the team. You know, and, and nothing. I'm not. I'm not pooping on Jesse Davis. I'm not. I'm not, I think he's a good role player. I don't think he's a 16 game starter. I was not a 16 game starter. That's fine. You can make a great living doing that. I think that watching Ingram, he could develop into a, he's going to be a 16 game starter, but I think he could develop into a very good 16 game starter, right? Like there's a difference. And again, I'm blue on him right now. There, there's nothing more to say than that. Then he has to go out and prove it when the real bullets are flying for an entire season. But I do think that he shows the intangibles. And I was, I was able to catch up with some of the Viking starters on the offensive line that I know well. And one thing that one of them told me is, hey, this guy's more ready to play as a rookie than I was. And he played as a rookie, right? And you guys can connect the dots on who that was. But at the same time, like that means a lot coming from guys that played as rookies and they understand how hard it is to play as rookies. To see a guy and say that about a guy is a huge compliment to him. And, you know, I know that he worked down with Duke Mannyweather down in Texas, which is one of the more O-line guru type places right now. And so, yes, he did get NFL coaching in the pre-draft process, which I think helped his development. And then you got a guy like Chris Cooper who played the position, right? You got a guy who played right guard. And so he's probably been helping, hey, this is what worked for me. Like, And I think that Chris Cooper is going to do a great job of, from what I saw, as far as like, it's not going to be a cookie cutter, like you have to do it this way, which most player coaches aren't because as players, you could never just do it one way. So I think he's going to give him tools that, like, hey, th there's some non-negotiables that we're going to have to do. But other than that, like, here's some tools and just block the guy. 
you know? And so I think that that works well for a rookie when you're not trying to square peg round hole technique and fundamental stuff, but you allow him to use his strengths and use the things that he does well and allow him to grow from that. But you're absolutely right. Kenny Clark is a star on the depth chart of can't let this guy wreck the game, which means you may slide to him more than you'd like to, or, you know, that might put a little more pressure over there on the left guard and the left tackle because we're sliding right a lot. But at the same time, if you're playing left tackle in this league, you have to be able to do that to become a great one. So I think there will be a lot more slides to him. But I mean, from games I remember watching past, Kenny Clark likes to eat Garrett Bradbury too. So hopefully both <laughs> sure those does. guys on Kenny Clark can not let them eat. Well, and this is where I think Ezra Cleveland ends up being sort of the swing player here. Although, I mean, look, Christian Derrissaw, I guess we've probably jumped to a conclusion on deciding that he's good. But Rashawn Gary emerged last year as one of the best mm -hmm. players in the NFL at his position as well. So, I mean, they're very dangerous up yes. there. Preston Smith is still on the team. Devontae Wyatt they drafted. I mean, they have lots of dudes on the defensive line, probably one of the better ones in the NFL. So it's an immediate test. But the guy, like Ezra Cleveland at left guard, with him and Darisol, we've sort of been like, oh, yeah, they're like there. Like, they're good. They're fine. I mean, I don't know. Like, Ezra Cleveland had a 55 pass blocking grade last year by PFF, which is below average. So if you're asking them to kind of move to the right a little bit more often to help out the rookie, then you're kind of leaving the left guard open here. And it's I, I think that how Kevin O'Connell game plans and schemes for this will actually tell us a lot. We had a conversation on the show the other day, like, does week one really tell you something? And I guess my answer is kind of yes. Like, not always, but sometimes it certainly can. And if they can't game plan for this, because again, this is not the Rams offensive line where you can game plan for your quarterback to have three seconds to throw. Like, these guys are going to get there. So how he game plans for the fact that you are at a disadvantage with offensive line versus defensive line, I think will be pretty telling. Right. And, and that's where I was kind of getting earlier. Where I was talking about the Dalvin Cook workload, right? Like, are we going to see, hey, we can't stand back here and throw the ball 60 times, right? Like we need to, we need to establish a run. And I think that Dalvin Cook is head and shoulders above guys like Cam Akers and the running backs that they had in LA, right? Like you're talking about a top five running back in the NFL behind you. Like, so use more of that, right? I think that you can be a much more balanced offense than what we saw the Rams were last year, right? They were very pass-heavy offense. Now they ran the ball some, but I think that when you have a guy like Dalvin, you you kind of eliminate some of that threat of the guys getting home by putting body blows on them early in the run game, right? Like if you can say, hey, body blows, body blows, double teams, get after these guys, like it slows them down. It does. isn't? And as an offensive lineman, you have to understand that that's the game plan. And if you get a chance to tee off on Kenny Clark on a double team, hit him as hard as he can, right? Because then when it's two minute drill in the fourth quarter, maybe he's half a step slower than he should be. And those things matter. And so I think that's part of the game plan that I'll be curious too, is how do we attack guys like Kenny Clark and Rashawn Gary in the run game? Do we bring a tight end back to hammer and cut Gary down a few times like they saw against Tribodeau? Like everyone will say that's a dirty block. That's a completely clean block where we saw against Tribodeau against the Giants where that tight end comes back and cuts him, right? And that just makes guys start thinking. That makes those DNs start thinking about, oh, my knees, my this, my that, and you think you're slow, right? So that's going to be a thing that I'll look for in the game plan too is how do we attack their edge rushers or even their interior rushers in the run game to slow them down in the pass game? He's got to prove it for you to uh, pronounce his name right, right? Kayvon Thibodeau? Whatever. He's a rookie. Rookies are you threw an extra R like in there? Uh, uh, but did that, I call him Thibodeau? That was that that was some kind of day on Twitter where it was like the typical people losing their minds. Right? like, that's a run play, my friends. That's a run <laughs> like, play. That is a full. Now, I do. I think that the NCAA made that rule illegal. Oh, really? So I, I okay. don't think in the NCAA you can do that anymore. So these defensive linemen in the NCAA are going to get this false sense of security and be like, oh, it's fine. And then here's going to come some tight end from the NFL and just say, hey, buddy, chop. So it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve. But those are great ways to just take hits on defensive ends and slow them down. But if you had that play and if everybody, you know, didn't see it, you know, the tight end comes back underneath the formation and then meets the defensive end while all the offensive linemen go to the left. That's the mm -hmm. best way I can describe it. And if that tight end goes head up on a defensive end, who's coming off the ball hard, you're going to have injured tight ends. I think uh, in the NFL, the, the, the power difference and the speed difference there, if the D end can be like, Oh, nice to meet you here. 225 pound <laughs> person. Uh, they usually go up against 325 pound people. So mm -hmm. they're just going to crush them. That's why it's allowed still. Now, maybe there's some sort of rule change, but 
Um, there was no reason for freak out there anyway. So I have a couple of quick, um, questions for you. Uh, but I want to get this on record first, whom do you think will win the football game? I whom? think whom, whom, I whom? don't know, man. It's so hard to bet against Aaron Rodgers, but I think that with the Vikings, I, I'm going to go with the Vikings. And here's why I say this. I think the U S bank factor is going to be a huge piece of this. I think that the energy and the excitement level is going to be hard to, for the Packers to combat. Now they, and another piece is there is no more Devonte Adams in green Bay. And I don't know who Aaron Rodgers is going to want to throw the ball to, right? Like you just knew when things broke down, it was like, okay, we're 17 and he's going to throw it to him. I'm very curious to see who that guy emerges for, for the Packers. And so that's why I'm not taking him because I don't trust the Packers offense. I just don't. I think that, yes, they're going to run the ball more, but when you don't have the, one of the best receivers in the NFL paired with the best quarterback in the NFL, things are messy. And I just, you've seen Aaron Rodgers in training camp talking about guys dropping balls and how they're not going to be playing. And maybe that's a little cat and mouse by Aaron Rodgers. I don't know, but he's, again, he's not a guy to pull punches. So I am a little concerned for what this Packers offense looks like, which is why I think I give the nod to the Vikings with the better offense, in my opinion, right now, as long as we can hold up up front. But also with the defense, I think that getting after Aaron Rodgers is going to be a hard thing for us to not do in U.S. Bank. I also am giving the slight edge to the Vikings here. And, you know, when you look at the Vegas line also, I think it's like minus one and a half Packers, which means like pretty close. I mean, the flip. Yeah, the Vikings give uh, or get, you know, I'm not a gambling expert, but I just, I've seen bigger numbers as the Packers come <laughs> to U.S. Bank Stadium in the past. Uh, so I think that uh, the the Vikings being given a fighting chance with a little bit, you know, of uh, extra because it's home field advantage. But I think more than anything, it's health that the Vikings will play Green Bay completely healthy. And, you know, one of the things I just, I feel like, I've noticed through the years when it comes to elite quarterbacks is when a, a, an average or good quarterback has everybody healthy and everything going well. And this goes for a lot of like, obviously you think of Kirk, but like a lot of quarterbacks, Derek Carr, Jared Goff, like they're all good at football. I mean, they can all make the plays, but when Aaron Rodgers has somebody hurt or his offensive lines beat up or his coach is a dummy or whatever, like <laughs> with McCarthy and, and you know, like whatever it might be Mahomes. Defenses are playing him different last year and, you know, oh, what's wrong with Mahomes? And then like three weeks later, they're just like leading the league and scoring again. You know, it's like when things go wrong, they can solve those problems. But for the Vikings, they have their full roster to start. So at at like peak strength roster, peak strength roster, I think these teams are fairly close. As a season goes along, I give a massive edge to Aaron Rodgers for making up for the things that go wrong versus Kirk. But as we start week one, you get to game plan all summer. You get to game plan all summer. Zadarius and Hunter a hundred percent versus them versus Bakhtieri coming back. Like I, I think that that's a close matchup and I give the slight edge to the stadium basically. And the noise being problematic without having that Devonte Adams factor, we could be like, Oh, everyone got the play wrong. Uh, throw it to Adams and he'll make <laughs> a catch. Right. Like that can't happen now. Right. No, I, I'm 100% with you on that. I think you, you nailed that. And I also think that Aaron Rodgers has played against Mike Zimmer for so long. Like it's going to take him a second to adjust to what's the new Viking defense, right? Like forever he knew, I mean, he was smart enough that even how Barr and him could play the chess match. Like he still knew what the Mike Zimmer defense was. Mm -hmm. He still knew where the issues were. He still knew where the guys were. And so that might take him even a half to try and figure out, okay, who, where's the holes in this? Where's the guy I want to attack? Where are all these things? Cause they're, the Vikings starters didn't play a ton on the preseason either. So, you know, there's not a ton of tape to, for Aaron to sit there and study. And you can watch Rams tape all you want of what the defense was or whatever tape you want to watch. Like, it's just not the same as going out there and seeing the real dudes doing it. So I do think it'll take him a little while to adjust of how he wants to attack this defense too. You know what we have to finish with here, right? What? Love to see it. Hate, hate to, see, to it. see it. That's what we have to finish. Oh, with. it's back. We're back, back. Matt. We're it back. Is back. It is absolutely back. Now I am not going to make, I am not going to make my love to see it. Anthony Richardson. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to talk about the draft until we have to talk about the draft, but I'm going to strongly hint that under other circumstances, after watching him play that I might have made it 
the love to see it. Okay. That's okay. how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to phrase that. It's a good that. underlying. That's how I'm going to phrase that. You know, I love to see the week one slate. I mean, I'll be clearly like watching Vikings Packers, but it's in the afternoon. So I get to see some early games. I just think that this, this had like Bengals and Steelers right away. You kind of get to see like the Steelers defense versus the Bengals offense. I think there's just a lot of really good matchups in week one. And I uh, would like to watch them. And also, I mean, you start out with an incredible game. Bills, Rams Mm. in LA. Like, thank you, NFL. That is a great choice. Dolphins, Patriots is kind of interesting. Like, oh, Jaguars, Washington. No, no, not that one. Uh, But there's a lot of other good matchups. So I think that, you know, I don't really care much for um, Broncos, Seahawks. But the Sunday night game, Cowboys, Bucks, like, but the Cowboys are kind of a mess this off season, Tom Brady, like, where did he go? What was he doing? Um, so I, yeah, I just, I love what they did with the week one slate and can't wait. You know, my love to see it might be some people's hate to see it, but I love to see the Viking staff willing to be like, you know what? Those picks last year, F them. They weren't, they weren't what we want. They weren't what we believe in. And that takes a lot because you're, you're eating dead money on those guys. Right, that signing bonus, that check has cleared and has been spent, right? Like, but I, I love the confidence in this staff to be like, you know what? Those weren't our guys. They weren't performing to the standard that we feel is performed to make this fifty-three man roster, and they cut high round draft picks last year. And so, no, I love that confidence coming from the Viking staff. Honestly, you know, you should uh, not that we uh, should take credit for our wins because we have plenty of losses with takes. But when Wyatt Davis was out of shape, when they said that, you were like, nope. Yep. out that's Done. bad that's really bad and that's how it ended up turning out but that that's a no that's a good point i agree with that and i also think that when they said competitive rebuild everyone went like oh let's see what they do to kind of competitive rebuild they did nothing to competitive rebuild but that's fine because you cut everybody to make your team better now you didn't cut you didn't cut guys just to be like well we drafted him and we'll see if he turns out in like 4 years. Mm-hmm. Rick Spielman was quoted talking about Amir Smith-Marset being like interesting to him cuz he drafted him and you're like no, you shouldn't just keep guys because they got a draft pick. And and they did that way too much. Like, oh, let's just hang on to this guy and see if he magically develops. He won't. After a year or two, he just probably won't, right? So it's like I like that they just said we want to make the team better and try to win and forget this whole competitive rebuild thing. Yeah, I'm 100. I love it. I think it shows a lot of stones by KOC and shows. I mean, it shows a lot of those dudes that they're here to win and they're not going to just be loyal to a fault to guys. I don't know what to use for hate to see it. It's week one of the NFL season. I don't know. Okay, I've got it. You played for the Buffalo Bills. I grew up in Buffalo. <laughs> I hate to see them a Super Bowl favorite. Like, no, uh, no, I mean, what I mean is that just can't. It, if the Bills are going to win the Super Bowl, it's in a year where everyone's like, I don't know about those Bills. And then they're totally shocked. It's not when they're the favorite. That's just begging for missed kicks or strange injuries or, you know, they've had coaches quit in the past. How many coaches just quit? The, the Bills have had two. So, like, I don't know. Like, I, don't tr- I don't trust it. I don't trust that team being a favorite, it's weird, and I, I am weird, like strangely hating to see it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go with my hate to see it. Is I hate the elimination of the fourth preseason game. I hate it. I, I think that I, I'm, and that's the undrafted free agent in me. Okay. Oh, okay. That is okay. The U, that is the UDFA in me that needed that fourth preseason game week, year in and year out, to make the football team. And you know, you saw a lot of guys this year that could have used that. Um, And so I also don't love this kind of just like dead week. That's just like between the end of the cuts and like when the week one is like, I don't really love this kind of just like limbo week and what we're in right now. Um, But so that's why I hate to see the elimination of that. I get the idea behind it. I get why you wanted to do it, but I just, I miss it. I miss the fourth preseason game of watching guys go out there and just the jungle which was make the team and just all hell. Bre- I used to watch all the fourth preseason games because you just you just never knew what you were going to see. It was just chaos. But a lot of guys made livings from that that just don't have the opportunity anymore. Fair enough. Fair enough. From my perspective, that fourth preseason game was pretty rough. Mitch Leidner starting for the Vikings. Like, I don't know, man. But I totally understand where you're coming from, that a lot of guys have uh, forced their way onto the team in mm-hmm. that fourth preseason game. And now they don't. 
have that opportunity. So um, anyway, well, week one, we are here. We have arrived. And scheduling wise, you every year plan a hunting trip. So you will be off the grid uh, in a shack in Montana or something in an undisclosed location, undisclosed location. So you will not uh, appear next week on Tuesday, but then the week after and the whole rest of the season, you'll be in. And then uh, whatever calamities may happen during the off season and so forth, uh, we'll do a little bit of that in the playoffs as well. So I I am excited to have you back and appreciative of all of your time, sir. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. And I hope that I'm not calling you on my way home from my hunting trip. Like I was last year. Like what the hell is going on? We got roasted by the Packers and then we were losing to the Colts. And I was like, what, what is happening, Matt? And you're just like, it's been a week, brother. It's been a week. <laughs> and that, well, and then last year, the Bengals, like you, yeah. should, you should win the game and you don't do the thing. And then a fumble <laughs> and off side penalties. Uh, and it was going to be a good year. So, it's going to be a good year. Yes, it is. Thanks, Jeremiah. Absolutely. See you.